and we are live. Welcome everyone. My name is Danny Amoka. Uh, it's Tech Excellence and uh, I, today I will be the co-host of this session with my friend together with uh, Oliver Ziller. Hey Oliver. Hello. Uh, let's get started. I would say so we are Tech Excellence. Our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. Uh, let me introduce you our organizers. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Valentina Cupac, who is the founder and the organizers, uh, organizer of these meetups. Uh, next to her, we have uh, Oliver Ziller. Uh, I already introduced him. Uh, he's also a co-organizer of this session. And last but not least, Daniel, me, uh, who is also a co-organizer of these uh, sessions. Uh, don't forget that we are uh, available and online on LinkedIn. So if you have any questions about technical excellence or the topics related striving for technical excellence, free, feel free to get in touch with us in LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, already uh, in this year so far, we have already had so many uh, amazing, uh, informative and fascinating sessions uh, by uh, software enthusiasts. Uh, you can find this session uh, in uh, YouTube. You can check them out. I highly recommend. Uh, and for this year, this is the last session. Uh, what we are going to do today and after that, we're going to have a break. And next year, we will come back with uh, even better sessions. You can, as I already mentioned, you can also find us on uh, social media, for example, uh, Meetup, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and of course, uh, GitHub as well. Uh, huge thanks to our sponsors, Optivem, and to our partner, QE Unit. So learn how to deliver quality software faster with us, technical excellence. Uh, so let me introduce to you the speaker of today. He's uh, Kenneth Pew. Uh, Ken is a software enthusiast helping teams to deliver software more efficiently. He is also a co-creator uh, of uh, Safe Agile Software Engineering, uh, and he is also an author of seven books. Let me repeat: seven books about topics for striving technical ex excellence. It's impressive performance. And the title of this talk today is "Using Acceptance Test Driven Development and Behavior Driven Development in Context with." domain-driven design and clean architecture. Uh, welcome, Ken. Uh, we are super excited to have you uh, today. Uh, and before I hand you the microphone, I would like to remind the audience that if you have any questions about the topics today, feel free to ask your question in the uh, YouTube comment sections. And at the end of the uh, meetup, we are going to dedicate uh, time for answering all of your most of your questions. Kenneth? Uh, I wish you good luck. The stage is yours. Uh, good luck. All right. Thank you very much. I'll wait till I get. Uh, am, am I in uh, full full screen mode? Because as you can see, I like to talk to my slides. I use them as as uh, both things that I can point to and I can uh, use as a demonstration. So. Using acceptance test driven development, behavior driven development in context with domain driven design and clean architecture. That's probably one of the longest titles you've ever heard. But it's going to be a talk where we show different aspects of ATDD, BDD, and how they all interact with the other aspects of design. So, what are the objectives for this? Well, an overview of ATDD BDD, probably a different one than you might have seen in other places. See how it works with domain driven design? And see how automating those scenarios for testing works with the hexagonal or the clean architecture. Okay. It was already introduced, but here's just a brief summary again. What's my job is to help teams deliver software more effectively. And I've got over two fifths of a century of software development experience. I'm the author of uh, Safe Agile Software Engineering and the seven books, which are going to be made reference to inside of here Lean Agile Acceptance Test Driven Development, Better Software Through Collaboration, Prefactoring. Extreme abstraction, extreme separation, and extreme readability. 
I'm probably one of the few people who suggests that if a code it implements a business rule that a business person wants, that that code should be readable by that business person. Extreme readability. And finally, interface-oriented design, how to design your microservices. So I've got a few overall rules. There are exceptions to every statement except this one. And what do I mean by that? When I say you always ought to do something, I don't mean always, always, but usually always. And when I say you never should do something, I don't mean never, ever, but usually never. So. If I say something, you go, that's not going to work here. Feel free to raise your hand with the exception, because we learn by the exceptions, as well as by the rules. Next, context is everything. Everything exists in a context. And everything is always true in some context. Ah, you take Netflix, 15,000 appointments a day. Now, what's the worst thing that can go wrong if something happens? The user's sitting there and the video doesn't work. Well, they click and they get reloaded onto a different server. And they go, ha, ah, my internet provider must be having problems. But if you are a software firm that's selling a stock, say, in investments, and you make a mistake so that a stock market transaction doesn't go through, well, you've got a disappointed customer and a security exchange commission that's going to get after you. So they don't do 15,000 deployments a day. Context is everything. And we'll talk about domain context, i.e. the business you're working with, the, uh, the context of your own background, your experience, the problems that you've worked with. All of that context comes into play, which comes up to the next point, perspective. Somebody looks at a, something and they go, oh, I see that. We got some reds and oranges and, and yellows in there. And they turn to somebody else and go, so what do you think? And that other person says, what in the world are you talking about? I see greens and, and blues. I don't see any oranges, any yellows. And you may start to get into a little discussion guy. Oh, what in the world's going on here? But then you turn to a third person. And the third person says, well, I see green and I see some reds and yellows. And now you start to get into an extended discussion. Some people might call it something other than a discussion. But what you really want to do is collaborate together and realize that you are simply looking at three different views of the same underlying truth and object. And what you want to do is combine those views together so that you come with a shared understanding and that each person adds a different perspective to that understanding both because they're looking at a different view and because also they come from a different context. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's do an introduction. What are behavior or acceptance tests? Well, from their external behavior of the system. Or their tests that test to make sure that behavior is acceptable. The user sends an input into the system, they get an output back out. Was that correct? We have a state change. You're doing an order. You push this submit button. Submit it or not. External behavior. Now that also includes that you may have things that are external to your system i.e. services or enterprise database. You are designing this system, but you're talking to this system and that system. We're looking at the external behavior, which also includes all the interactions with other systems. So I've got a couple of definitions. 
acceptance criteria. Those are general ideas of acceptance. And acceptance tests are specific tests that either pass or fail. And they are implementation independent. They do not matter whether you're programming in Java, in C Sharp, in Ruby or whatever. Acceptance test implementation language independent. So what's an acceptance criteria? Hmm. Well, we're doing a calculator. The sum must be correct. Acceptance test. When I add two plus two, I get four. No questions. Maybe I also want to go minus two plus minus two equals minus four. That's a specific test that either passes or fails. If it fails, system does not behave. It's doing unacceptable behavior. So let's talk about one more definition, the triad. The triad, three perspectives, not necessarily three roles, but three perspectives, the developer, the tester, and the customer. The customer perspective provides the requirements, the desired behavior. The developer perspective implements the requirements, i.e. the behavior. And the tester's perspective both critically analyzes the requirements and the implementation. Three perspectives on an application or a solution. So what is the difference between ATDD and BDD? Actually, not much. In fact, they're just two slight variations of perspectives on the same thing. Behavior-driven development defines the behavior of the system, which you're going to test. Or acceptance test-driven development creates tests for the acceptable behavior of the system. We have behavior we're going to test. We create tests for that behavior, and the outcome is just about the same. So just two slight variations on exactly the same underlying principle. And they both all both use the idea of having a triad, having three perspectives to help determine that behavior. So what's the goal of ATDD BDD? Well, it's to replace misunderstanding with shared understanding. If we have shared understanding of what the behavior should be, then the developers implement that desired behavior. One of the most uh, common complaints I've heard from developers is unclear requirements. And as we'll see, BDD and ATDD scenarios will, can give the most clear requirements that you so let's look at the two perspectives here. And our BDD, ATDD, we have our triad over here, the developer, tester, and customer that are defining the external behavior of our system. And we're going to define all of the behavior of the system. And internally, we're going to break up that behavior into components which are going to collaborate together to provide that external behavior. And so internally, we're going to be doing designing, coding, and testing, three, three perspectives on creating that, those components. But the components are designed to meet the external behavior. And that's what really design is about. So let's take a look at the software development workflow. Now, this looks like waterfallish, but if you just take a single story and work it through this, this workflow, it's being agile. You decide you're going to do something else on that story. Maybe you do a little design, do some coding and testing. Might have a little more testing for the application as a whole, security testing, performance testing, so forth. Then we deploy and we deliver. And we go back after deployment, 
and start on the next story in the log. So we have simply a continuous loop. And what am I going to talk about today? Well, deciding, detailing, designing, coding, and testing. And this, there's also sort of like a little loop right in here too. Because you can be designing, coding, and testing. Some people do it simultaneously. I tend to prefer to do some design first and then do some coding and testing. So let's first do the design. Here's an example. Here's an application we think that we want that keeps track of manual tests and it'll decrease the effort in running those tests by 5% as measured by the number of hours expended in manual testing. This is an actual application. If you go to kenpew.com and click on the upper right, it'll take you to a page that has links to the actual code for this application. Okay. And it also has a link to the a PDF for all of these slides as well. So here is the hypothesis. This is why we're going to do something. And uh, stories or features should have hypotheses. Why are we doing this? And how do we know that we're done? Hypothesis-driven development. It could be a whole session in and of itself. But we need that before we continue along because we need a why we're doing an application. So let's have a feature in a story. As a user, I want to be able to record test results for manual tests so I know which tests have been run at any time. I want to keep track of all my manual tests Keep a history of them, know which is success, which have failed, and maybe some details on what the failures were. Right? You might already have a program to do this. If you don't, you can use the one on the, that's on GitHub. So first, we're going to start with some high-level detail. Here's my system design document. As I say, I like to do a little bit of design first. Okay. I'm not a formal design person, but I like to have some idea of where I'm going, a big picture map of what this design is going to look like. So there's my design document I start with. And now I need a big picture workflow. We're going to, our workflow is going to, somebody's going to create a test script. They're going to create a test on our application that utilizes that test script. We're going to run that test, and then we're going to have a report on those tests. It's a workflow. And the part that we're going to be doing uh, and showing here is simply this one stage. We'll assume that you've created a test script, and you've created a test that utilizes that test script. And we're gonna show just the running part. And then obviously, you can always record on all of these tests. So context is everything, as I say. Here's a context diagram. There's an actor doing some input and output to our system. We have inputs from other systems, outputs to other systems. Okay. I always like to draw a context diagram for any system so I can understand what's inside and what is outside. In fact, this is a beginning on your clean architecture or diagonal architecture. It's just a very simple version of it. So here's my generic example. Now we have our uh, actor. They send a command into the system. They get a result of that command back out that they can see. Maybe they go to a, some database to store some information or maybe retrieve some information, an external system. Or maybe they do a request and get a response back from does that, it presents the view. Now I know on a generic level how big my system is and what other systems 
that it needs to talk to. So let's look at our pest reporter context. We have actually two actors, somebody who creates the test and somebody who actually runs or executes that test. And our test recorder system, well, it's gonna to talk to a database where we store all the results. It's gonna to talk to a file system where we actually store the test scripts. And we're gonna have a time clock. Oh, that time clock, that's the system clock that it's going to input in when the test is run. Now, the reason I like to do this contact diagram is all of a sudden it goes, well, I may need some test doubles for these. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. I may need a test double for, should I, database? Hmm. Probability is I'm going to want to have a test double for my time clock. In a lot of systems, you like to have a test double so you are repeatable. We'll talk about that. So let's look at a couple of the story details. Here was our big workflow, and now let's break it into a smaller workflow. We're going to execute that test script, we're going to record the result, and we're going to record the comments that the test runner made during that time. So he's going to either have failure or success with some comments. There's our workflow. So now, we've got three different types of behavior. We have flow behavior, domain terms, and business rules. Three different types of behavior. Separation of concerns. So let's look at this behavior. The scenario for flow. A scenario is one path through a use case. Now, I know you've been talking about use cases and, and everything. Alistair Coburn had a book on use cases, a whole series of that. And use cases can be a little more complicated than just a, a simple little thing. They can include alternatives, exceptions, and everything. Scenario is simply one path through that use case. Maybe it's the main path, maybe it's an exceptional path, maybe it's an alternative path. And here's our layout for a scenario. We give it a name. Given the current state of the system, I, these are also known as preconditions in the, in the use case world. When an event or action occurs, oh, Allah could be a domain event. You're doing event driven design. When an event or action occurs, then we get either a new state, an output, or both. Those are the post conditions. So, given a current state, when an event or action occurs, then we get a new state, an output, or both. That is a flow. Change of state or output. So now, let's start with a basic, what I call an outline script. This is an outline, it says, here's, a, here's our basic flow, but it needs a bit more detail. We're gonna run a test successfully. Given that the test exists already, and that would have been created by a different scenario, okay? When the test is run, then the test gets updated with the results of the run. Excuse me one second here. There's our flow. Now, what we need to do is add data to that flow in order that we can actually then start to develop things. So here is our scenario with data. Now, in order to make this big enough, all these 
three lines are actually extending out this way, but I put them under the separate lines just so it, it becomes more readable. So let's take a look at this. Given that a test exists, now we would have had a discussion with our triad about all of these things. And this is what they would have come up with. We've got an issue ID. Maybe that relates to some number in a, in a requirements document. Maybe it relates to a JIRA card, whatever. So we have some issue ID and we'll give it a name. We have a runner, the person who runs the test. The last result of the test, the date that it was last run, and here's this date previous result, which means when was it that it actually ran the last time it ran the other way? So if we had a success on some date, but we had a previous failure, we would put the date of that previous failure. There. And then we've got a file path, which is actually the file that contains the test script. And then a place for our comments. Okay. So we would have had a discussion with the triad going, oh, why, why are we putting it in, a, in a, at the file path? Why don't we just put the script in here? Maybe we want to keep all of our scripts in source code control. And then we're simply going to make a reference to that file from our testing. Good. We have a, we already have a source code control system. We don't want to have to repeat it in, in, in our design. So now, Here's our, given that we have a test, and when we create the test for the first time, we're simply going to say, well, it never ran, and it's never been the opposite because it's never ran. Then we make sure that everybody agrees with this flow. And we're going to run the test. We get a result that says, yes, it's successful. The comment said it works great. Sam was the person who ran it. And here was the date and time on which it was run. And now, when we run that test, the test is now, our runner is Sam. Our last result was success. The date it was last run, and of course, we never got the previous result, and we have our work sprint. Wow. There is our given when then. Okay. Our three steps. We look at it on the, on the uh, if you go to the source file, code, you'll see that it's a little bit shorter because we can fit everything on the single lines here instead of having to split them into three. Yeah. Have we got everything? Yeah. Customer in the triad, but then you might want to go to some of the users gone. Have we captured everything? Uh, is there anything else you'd like us to, to capture? Now, it turns out that I showed this to one one person, Chad Hendrickson, I said, uh, so what do you think? And he said, you know, it'd be nice if we actually kept a history of all the tests, okay? So that it's not just we keep the last result, but maybe we want to keep a history of them. And we'll see an update a little later on that. But what do we have here? We have the beginning of our domain. Our domain terms and our domain entities. Each one of these attributes that we have listed here can become a domain term. And each one of these collections, i.e., this collection, this 
is an entity. The test run itself, those four pieces, that also can become a entity. So when we have a given when then, and we put data in it, it becomes a potential entity. Okay. We may decide that maybe it's only part of an entity, maybe it really consists of two entities that we crammed together in a single line, but we have our first cut of design, our entities, and in particular, our domain terms. So, we've only got one, one here, we're going to have one that for creating a test. Maybe we'll have one for running another test successfully or unsuccessfully and so forth. We've got a lot of information that we can derive from just this single scenario. Entities, domain terms, and everything else. And it's readable. And we're not worried about our implementation yet. We're worried about understanding the problem. So that's a flow. The flow is given the state, i.e., of our test, where we had never run it, when we run it, this is the new state of our test. So all of that information I'm talking about, we yield those domain terms. Some people call them value objects. I call them domain terms because it is a domain. And they yield those entities that composite of attributes. And all of those attributes typically are domain terms. And then entity collections, i.e., Entity collections typically have some persistence, also called a la repositories, if you will. You could be using terms that are derived from DDD, but when I did many of my things, DDD, the Domain Driven Design book, hadn't yet come out. So I'm every time I read another book, I, co I take the information and I coalesce it into my model, if you will, See, maybe it throws out some things in the model. Maybe it's simply some different perspectives on the same thing in my, I'll call it my software model of design. Okay. So, one way we're going to implement this. Domain terms get declared as domain term types, abstract data types. And domain term types basically have Two things, a to string and a from string. The to string, just the method. The from string could either be a constructor that takes a string, or it could be a, a static class method that typically called parse that takes a string and constructs an object of, <coughs> of that class. So we've got domain terms and domain term types. So we might have multiple domain terms of the same domain term type, i.e. you might have a domain term type dollar, and you're going to utilize that in lots of different places. Or some domain terms, there is only just one of them, and so your domain term type and your domain term itself, the concepts sort of get merged together. And then we have our entity, where all the attributes are domain terms. And of course, the entity itself is a domain term, but I'm just keeping them separate so we can talk about entities that have attributes and domain terms, which are just individual pieces. And now I tend to add one more thing an entity DTO, data transfer object. The attributes are all strings. In the entity itself, they are going to be abstract data types. In the DTO, it's a string that's initialized appropriately. Why do we need an entity DTO? Because we need to send it out to a service. When we typically 
don't ship an object over there. We're no longer doing uh, remote uh, method calls where we serialize the objects and everything. Everything goes to a string, JSON, XML, whatever, and it comes. So we're going to need representations of the entity as strings. And finally, there's an entity collection, i.e., that's our persistence. Okay, you could use a list, you could use a collection. Oh, how do you store the entity collection? Well, could you use a database? Yeah. Could you just serialize the collection? Yeah. We're not worried. Now we're getting into details, but we're not getting into all the ultimate. So let's look at a domain term. Here's a domain term called result, the result of the test. And we have two result values, success or failure. Now, somebody could probably will go, oh, you could use a Boolean for that. Fine, use a Boolean in your implementation if you wish, but I'm going to have this as our communication between all members of the triad, a domain term, success and failure. What's one other way to represent it? An enumeration, if you will, instead of a, a uh, using Boolean. And then, here's a domain term type, an issue ID. The issue ID, we decided, should have some sort of uh, restrictions on how it can be formed. So an issue ID must be five characters or digits without any spaces. Value, yep, yeah, that's valid. A, one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's valid, but one space, one, two, three, no. One, two, three, four, no. One, two, three, four, five, six, no. And we simply list all of what's uh, examples of what's valid and invalid. And this is now where your tester perspective is, is going on, going, well, let me see if there's one more possibility we want to try out here. Okay. Uh, maybe there's another possibility one we want to try. Out. Here is your definition of what a dope issue ID should look like, as well as examples of those issue IDs. And now we have business rules. Now this program doesn't really have complex business rules. Lots of programs, in fact, I estimate that at least 50% of all the code in this world is about writing business rules. Oh man, there are so many business rules if you're doing insurance and finance and everything. So this is just a simple business rule. We want to update the test from our test run. So we have a variation. Let's see, the result is different than the previous. We have a variation where the result is the same as the previous. And we have a, a variation where the test has never been run. So we'd like to check all of those three things. And this is now where, ha, huh, if you look at the code itself, you'll see this in much easier to read form, but we have multiple variations here. And I'm just, those multiple variations all spread out, which makes this a bit harder to read. So, I'm going to show just one of these variations, if you will. And once again, these three lines should actually be all as part of a single line. But here's our business rule. Our business rule consists of inputs and outputs and some calculation between. So if this was my test, I had a failure and I never had run it. 
and I never ran it. And some people say, oh, well, it shouldn't be called a failure, then maybe we should have some other name for it. Perfectly fine. But we assume that since we never ran it, the test is, is failed. When we get a success on that date and time, then our new result is a success on that, but we don't change the previous result since we haven't had multiple variations of this. Now notice this is a business rule. It does not require a test. It's utilized by a test, but it's not required to have a test object to run this on. This, in fact, becomes a functional programming. We simply give it some values and we get a result back. Business rules often can be implemented by a single method. Wow, if I've got something that is a single method, isn't that a unit test? Yeah, if you're talking about the coding part, but this is a unit test in terms of the behavior part. This is a unit of behavior, and it's a behavior that is defined so that it's readable by everyone in the track. Wow. So, Ken, you mean if we split everything down into all of these small little pieces, we actually going to be writing tests that may be implemented by single methods? Yeah. And you're going to be having those tests in a readable format, which, if we're having business rules, it turns out that if the customer says, I want a change in my business rule. They simply change the code, or you change it together if they decide they don't want to edit it themselves. You change it, you run the, 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 the new test, if you will, it fails because obviously it hadn't been implemented like that, and then you correct it, and the test passes. Hmm. Customers can actually document their specific requirements by simply changing a Gherkin file. Yeah, and it's done by people. Now, some people say, hey, uh, customers never read about this, read this stuff, but they wanna read it, it's there. So, flow, domain terms, and business rules. A separation of concerns. All documenting our domain and ready for automated testing. Now, how much time does it really take to do this, to turn these into automated tests? Well, if you're using a Cucumber or you're using um, SpecFlow or many other things like that, all it takes is a single click of a button and a couple of lines of code that will actually get you to where you simply call your production code from within that uh, glue code, as it's called, that connects this to your actual production code. And by having the test in a non-code method, if you decide to refactor everything underneath, this is the test. You don't have to refactor your test. You may have to, if you change your interfaces and everything else, you may have to redo your glue code, but the test has not changed. Hmm. No change in test, even if we have changes in code. So now, Let's look at how this all applies in our clean hexagonal architecture. We have our time clock, our file system, and our database that are our services on this side. Our domain terms like issue ID actually are applicable to the external world because we're going to be using that formatting as part of our, of our interface. 
their domain terms are also to the into the core. And in fact, all of our individual components should be operating on domain terms rather than on doubles or floats. The scenarios, i.e., that run test scenario, is going to be utilized for our core, and it's also going to be utilized to run against the UI to make sure that the UI is properly plumbed to the core. And then we have our business rules, which are going to be run their component. Small, medium, or large. Okay. And those business rules, of course, will show up in a flow test. They'll be utilized by some flow test. So that's how they all fit. And the only other thing is uh, these test, these text objects, these DTOs, is that if I'm getting data from the outside world, it's going to be strings. And I'm going to be utilizing it in the outside world. But as soon as it comes into my internal world, I convert it to my object, to my code, to my domain term, and everything. Even if I get it from the database, well, they're typically storing it as textual things, even though they got numbers and everything else. But when it comes from the date database and I take the strings and I convert it, or from another service, I take the strings and convert it, and I make sure that everything is valid before I actually start manipulating inside. DTOs to the outside, when we read them in, convert it to our objects and validate before doing anything else. So let's look at design momentarily. Here. See, we've got just a few minutes left. Test doubles for all the external dependencies. That's the minimum number of test doubles that you need. Why do we want to do those test doubles? If the external dependencies are slow, expensive, or random. If they're none of those, we might just use the actual service, the actual dependency itself. And but if it's also changeable by others, we want to also create a test double for it because we want our tests not to fail because somebody else changed the database. So where are our test bubbles going to be used? Well, should we use a test a database test double? Or should we use an actual database? We'll come back to that question. Should we use a test double for the file system where we're going to do our test script? Uh, why not just use a file system? Definitely have a time clock test double. Oh, and by the way, should our test fail because somebody else is running it and therefore then the names don't match? Maybe we want to have a test double for our user identity. And we have all of those you'll see in the source code. So, how are we going to create those test doubles? Well, we could use an interface inside, and we could have an internal list of things that we keep, could keep. And we might use a list or map or anything like that. And if we needed to store this away, we could write it out to a file and read it back in. Or, and, and the production version would be something that actually calls the SQL. Or we can actually have use SQL as our interface. We use a test double, a simple, simple database that we use only for testing, and we use SQL as our interface to it. Hmm. So do we want to create an interface? Do we want to utilize SQL as our interface? Well, it's a little slow, but guess what? You're testing more of the system. Now, this is what I call the power of three. It's come from Jerry Weinberg, who had a phrase, 
If you can't come up with three solutions to a problem, you don't understand the problem. And this is going to be applicable to many things. But let's take this example here. We have this business rule that we update a test from the test run. Who should be responsible for calling that business rule? Well, we have three possibilities. The test could do it. The test run could do it. Or we could create a third-party object that does it. Assigning responsibilities to objects is a very important. Now, that's our that's a decision. That's the design. Who should be responsible for something? Let's take one more thing. Turns out that we decided we wanted to add sorting. So when we have a list of tests on the screen, who should be responsible for sorting them? Should the database sort them? Should the core logic sort them? Or should the display sort them? You want to come up with three possibilities, as I mentioned, for everything. And then instead of just doing it, just step back a moment and go, step back, take your hands off the keyboard and go, yeah, let's have a discussion. Great time for a discussion. I'm, I'm a firm believer in pair or triad designing. This is a time to step back, think about it for a moment. Database, sure, we could do the sorting there. They've got, they've got a sort in SQL. Well, uh, we could do the Core, yeah, we can write a little function that does the, the core quick sort. Ah, the display. If we have the display do it, it turns out that using swing, the uh, table already has a built-in sort. All you have to do is say turn on sorting, and then you don't have to worry about click out, you know, capturing presses of the column headers. It's already built in. If we did it in our core our database, ah, it's a little bit tougher. We have to actually start to implement the column headers and gives us more work to do. So maybe we did, the decision was to put it into the display. Oh, how about doing filtering? Turns out if we have so many tests, maybe we only want to see the ones that have failures in them. So we don't want to see everything. Display core or database. Hmm. Well, it turns out swing tables, you can do some filtering. Oh, but why that becomes a little nasty, some of those things. Yeah, you can do it in the database. You could do select where, but that means that every time you decide to do a different form of filtering, maybe you'd have to go write some more SQL. Maybe we'll just do it in the core. It's simple to go through a list and, 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 and do a predicate on it and just find out, uh, determine whether these things should be entered or not. So maybe the decision becomes different. You might have made a different decision. That's okay. You might have tried, in fact, one based on what you thought. Didn't work. You try another. But always start, try and start to come up with three. So now we do our code and testing. In fact, this is just a slight variation of what we had. We ran the test. Here was our test. And then we're going to set our test doubles so that the value for the runner is Sam and the value for the current date is this. When we select to run that test and we run it with success for the result and works great, we're going to come out with our new test. But here's just the variation that these two parts are actually setting our test doubles to those values and this is actually what you would enter onto the screen. 
And then there is our result. So what other flows could we have? And you'll see them in, in the code. Add a test, add a test with the same identifier. We're not going to allow that. Run a test multiple times. You'll see a lot of feature files with all of these tests. And you can examine them. Try it all out. All you need is to have, as the notes say, a SQL database that you can, you can communicate with because we want something to test. And by the way, when you look at this, we do have a background. That is something that is run for every one of these scenarios. And this is going to set up some configuration values for us, i.e., where is the root file path to where all those test scripts are. We create in our background that actual file to make sure that we have a file that has a test script in it that we can utilize. So, Final couple of things. Here is our, our test pyramid. It starts out, oh, some people have this test pyramid and they go unit test, integration test, end to end test. And it turns out that everybody starts arguing about what's an integration test. Ooh, I'm not even going to get into that detail. I'm going to be utilizing Google's which is large, medium, and small. Small tests run fast, medium tests take what? more time, and large tests take much more time. Where do all of our tests fit in? Business rules and domain terms fit into the small. A scenario without a UI fits into the small. Then a scenario with a UI might be a medium, a full step of a workflow might be a medium. A step with the UI, i.e. just running a test, maybe a medium, but a full workflow going from create a test script and this and that and that, well, that's definitely a lot. So we want to have lots of smalls, very few larges. And that's what are separating things into main terms and business rules, scenarios that can be run automatically, scenarios that can be run with you. And so, if you want to see some more examples of this, I've got a few, and the links are also on kenpew.com if you go to that page, and you can see things that have been written with unit tests that this D will be the BDD ATDD version of this. For example, Kent, Kent Beck, wonderful book on TDD. This requirement driven development and test driven development gives an example of using behavior from the external world and breaking it down into business rules and everything else using the same problem that Kent. Uh, did in his book. A different perspective. You might go, well, I like Ken's way. Perfectly fine. Just look from a different perspective. It might give you a different viewpoint. Okay. So that uh, concludes my talk, and I think we're going to start and open it up to, to QA here. What an uh, energetic session. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed it. Great job. Excellent job. Uh, I think the, the one of the biggest power of this uh, ATTD that uh, it really streamlines the communication between the developers and the uh, users and the stakeholders. So we can, uh, you know, by using this, we can close this gap, which can prevent misunderstanding, which can bring clarity and, of course, reducing a lot of wasted efforts. So, yeah, excellent. I really loved it. Great job. Thank you. And I really like that you mentioned this, um, that you can actually show it to the, the business and they can actually verify if what, what was written, if that is correct. I mean, I think this is probably one of the most important things that you actually built the thing right, right? 
<laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, I've read a few few articles that say, eh, just write your code so it's readable. And I, I would agree with that. However, even looking, even looking at well-written code can be sometimes a turnoff. It's like, oh, I'm not, I'm not a coder. I'm not a programmer. I'm, and, and, and it's like, uh, I, what I use is Excel. And I go, great. Look at these tables. They're exactly Excel. We're speaking your language. <laughs> Back to the Excels, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, from the QA section, actually, we have uh, one topic. Uh, we could, it's not a question we could talk about. It seems like it well, everything was understood by the audience. And after that, we could uh, we have some uh, questions so we can uh, bring them on. Uh, so here there was one thing from uh, Wolfgang Klinger. Maybe you we would like to hear your take on this. I'm going to put it on the screen, but I'm going to also read it out. So namely, from Wolfgang Klinger, he said, unit is not equal to method. Can be, but often not the best idea. Uh, what is your take on it? Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, what can you oh. advise regarding this? Oh. Excellent, excellent point. Okay, this is why, in fact, I don't use the term unit when I'm talking about uh, <laughs> when I'm talking about from the aspect of external behavior. I can talk about a unit of behavior, i.e., um, something, a business rule, a, a something like that, which it turns out happens to to wind up to to be a method or maybe a a few things. And so, yeah, a unit isn't necessarily a method. In fact, if I was doing unit testing, uh, if I was doing down, uh, uh, say, I'm testing a uh, file operations, I cannot, and I'm testing the right method. I can't test the right method all by itself. I have to open up a file. I have to write something to it. I have to close the file. So I'm really talking about one unit of behavior, i.e. the ability to store something to an external system, which may involve two, three, five methods. Now, if it involved 500 methods, typically we wouldn't call that a unit test. So there's a, there's a boundary somewhere in Amazing. Very good. Thank you very much. Also, we have to be careful, right? I mean, because if you write, uh, if you would write tests for every method, then uh, our test would be too fragile to change it. So, for example, let's say we want to do some refactoring, and if, if you have always have breaking tests, then you know uh, what do they do? Then our test wouldn't have so much value. So we really have to, as you said, we really need to couple our tests to the behaviors instead of internal code structures such as uh, functions. So, yeah, excellent point. Oliver? No. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I was wondering, whenever I, I try to do some clean architecture, I never really know where to do the mapping from strings to, to you, what you call these abstract data types. I mean, can you actually expose that far out or, or where do you do it? Do you do it basically inside? The, the let's say use case or I mean can I expose I mean for me the, the these these domain terms are very specific to to the application so I never know can I actually expose it um, to the outside world or should I just pass some primitive strings and then map it inside I don't know if that's really relevant but I I, I struggled a lot I, I never know if I can actually use them in my for example methods okay so. What my suggestion is, is if we have an internal, well, it's a, let's even talk about just the domain term, which is, is going to be a, 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 single, a single class. And it's got a from string and a to string. Mm -hmm. As soon as I get something from the external world that represents, say, an issue ID, and I'm moving it inside, I call that method. And I may call it actually from the UI itself, okay? Or I could duplicate the method inside the UI, whichever you like. But in essence, as soon as I'm inputting that from the UI, I call the, I call the, 
the from string method, the constructor of the parse, and either I get an error, in which case I ask the user to give me the string again, or I accept it. On the other hand, I'm doing it from the database. As soon as I read that string from the database, I once again convert it. And I then, if I have it in, oh, that's interesting. Suppose I read the thing from the database and it was improperly formatted. Oh, database, you want to try again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, nope, 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 uh, that's still, no, I tried again, still the same thing. Oh, but we really want to be able to do that at that point. And now you have to make the decision, what should we do? Oh, that's, handling errors is a mark of a good program. What do we do if we get a badly formatted thing from a database? Should we? throw out the transaction? Should we put a, a default value in? Should we, as soon as I get it from the external world, I convert it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have an entire, say, um, uh, I'm, I'm reading from a database, so I'm reading a record, I'm going to read it into what I call the DTO, which is just all strings, because that's simple enough to do. And now I'm going to ask, <clears throat> I'm going to pass that entire DTO to my, to my class and say, convert everything. And then report an error back if there's a, an issue. So I've got for every entity, for every Entity that has like say 12 attributes, I have a DTO that has 12 attributes. As soon as I read those in from the database, pop. I read them in from a from a uh, UI, I checked it individually. So hopefully when I read it in, I don't get any mistakes. I get it from a web service, I read it in, and then of course. Web service has the same problem. Sorry, you gave me a wrong thing, but I've caught that error as soon as I can. The sooner I can tell you I have an error, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, in fact, has been a standard. Let's validate as soon as possible and don't do any processing if, we, if we've got invalid data. Did, did that answer your question? No, yeah, that's great. So um, how, how would you deal with database abstractions? I mean, the, these kind of database tables that are actually called entities, but what they actually are, are just database tables, and some people use that as their domain. We, I mean, clean architecture tries to avoid that, but what's your stance on it? Well, my stance is we know, well, like, let's say two things. I going to have a collection of entities, okay? <laughs> I mean, there's almost no problem in this world that doesn't have a collection of entities, okay? So now the question is, uh, uh, I want to persist those entities, okay? So that when my program goes down and comes back up again, I need to be able to get those entities again. So we have at least three different ways that we could do that. I could have my collection and I could serialize it. Oh, serializing and unserializing? Ooh, why not? It turns out actually, I uh, there was one place that had this entire, oh, if you want to talk about a database, it had uh, uh, records that were linked to records that had sub records and subfields and subfields, and it was like, 32 tables inside that basically each the table stored individual pieces of a collective record. Okay. So think of something, a class that had with subfields and everything else, it had like 50 subfields that each got stored in different database, you know, tables, because they wanted to make it, you know, well formed. I, there were only like 50,000 records that were going to be kept in here. I said to him, 
why are you keeping this in a database? You got to take each of these and do selects and do, oh man, it was like, you got to be kidding. Why don't you just serialize the whole thing, read it back in, do all your operations. If you change a record, you just serialize it out again. And they're going, yeah. Okay. It's possible. <laughs> it, it's possible. In fact, <laughs> it saved them a lot of time mm -hmm. in, in creating all these things. So that's one way of persisting. But okay, if we're going with millions, it's hard. So if I've got my entities inside, if I simply say, I'm going to use my database to be a persistent storage where I can change individual row in my collection. Excuse me. Entity, an individual entry in my collection, which turns out to be a row in your database. Okay. So if I look at my database, it's simply here is a nice way of being able to store individual entries in a collection so I don't have to back up the entire collection. Well, that's one way of looking at a database. Mm -hmm. I'm using it for my persistent storage of my. My things. And in fact, I could use that database for these elaborate things, but in what I would, for the example I was just giving, because I got 50,000 of these things, I would put onto my database each quote row would simply be a serialized single object. Well, now I only have to write out a single row at a time in order to get things. I don't have to write out all 50,000. So why? So uh, this is my long-winded way of saying there are at least three ways to do anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it depends. I think this is the answer to anything. It depends. Yes. It depends. And so the, the issue is, what are you using the in a lot of cases, if we have a simple entity, it tends to match to a single, you know, a table in a database. So we just use, we're using the tables of the databases as a persistent story for our entities, you know. So did that answer your question? That might have been a yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have another question yeah. from the from yeah. the audience. In the meantime, we have another question from Jovan. Uh, let me put it in a screen uh, and let, let let us see if you, I mean, if we can really go into detail of this because it's sort of a practical question. So from Jovan, thanks for the great presentation, Ken. Could you walk us through developing a simpler feature for a web application, for example, a client management CRUD system in a particular technology, JavaSpring.net? So it sounds like a really exercise practical question, maybe from high level. Could you give us an example? Who would you approach this problem with ATDD or you know, give us your two cents or oh, using a oh oh, oh particular oh. technology, everything I've talked about is implementation independent. Oh True. Um, Language agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All of that stuff I happen to develop in Java. Could it be developed in C sharp? Could it be developed in Ruby? Everything that I show, if you look at all of the feature files and everything, they are language independent. Right. So now, um, so walk us through a simple feature for web app. So if I was doing a web app, let's just do this. The basic thing is, if I've got a web app, all right, let's make it. Um, we're going to create Twitter. Since Twitter may be going away, we may need to create a new Twitter. <laughs> okay. Let's look at what a tweet a tweet is. It's a message. Domain term. I'm on, on a web app, I send a tweet and I receive tweets. I have followers and I people I'm following. Wow. So now I've got scenarios. Add, follow someone, be followed, 
send a tweet and receive a tweet. Wow. Given I have three followers, when I send this tweet, then the three followers see it on their screen. There's there's my there's my scenario. There's my I've got a ad fo- talking about the crud. I've got an ad follower. I've got a delete follow, and so forth. So we're going to have scenarios for each one of those. We're going to have a scenario for the action. Oh, we're going to have a scenario that it not only, in fact, when we send the tweet out, not only do the three followers see it, but it goes into my tweet history. <laughs> so now I've got a domain term tweet history that I need to, to keep around. In fact, so what we do is we take those scenarios, we start, we develop the scenarios first. In fact, here's an interesting comment, which people might not have read about. In Kent Beck's book, he makes the comment, write all the tests first. Some people think about TDD as, oh, well, I write it, I, I do a test and I write another test. He actually says, write all the tests first. Now he says, put them on a to-do list. <laughs> sure. Detail every one of the tests. But he says, write all the tests first because that gives you an idea of the problem. So what we're going to do is write all of those scenarios first. Okay. And at some point you go, hey, I think I've got enough. I've got the picture down. Uh, let's, let's start implementing it. Oh, what do we want to start with first? Ah, tweet. Oh, 128, oh, we can be 255 now, right? <laughs> Let's start with a, a, a tweet object. Let's start with user objects and users have follow lists and following, follower lists and following lists. Okay, let's develop that and so forth. And then finally, okay, and we can do most all of that without even having a GUI. No need for a GUI. We can do all of our work simply by calling the appropriate core functionality. And then you go, oh yeah, I guess we need to have a GUI. Uh, <laughs> and you pop that right on top and you make sure that the tweets get plumbed into the tweet sender and you make sure that the, the tweet display is plumbed correctly to the tweet receiver. Uh, let's see. Now, I never talk about technology. Oh, I don't even know if I want to use Spring. <laughs> Changes too quickly. Fact, what? Changes too quickly. Yeah, that's like implementation details. Yeah, that's that's an implementation detail. And why do I need Spring? Uh, to, because I'm going to be substituting multiple implementations of something in. Oh, well, actually, let's, let's, in fact, since it brings up one more thing, I, I have a lot of things I can talk about. But Spring is a way of bringing multiple implementations in, i.e. a way of injecting different implementations in it, right? Okay, what other ways can we do that? Well, we could have the old-fashioned have a a factory, a strategy with a factory. We have four strategies with a factory that selects them. Oh, okay. Oh, that's code. Oh, oh okay. We, oh, Spring does it for you. Okay, but it, we could still use it. If we, if we only had four different things, do we need to bring Spring in if there's only three or four different things that we're going to have interfaces for mm. that we need? different implementations for. If we only have one, <laughs> do we really need Spring? <laughs> but the next is, okay, so we could use Spring, we could use a factory. What's another way we can do this? 
without creating an interface. Ah, oh, in fact, in some of my classes, people go, oh, Ken, what? Yeah, that was, that's, it, that's it. I said, we can put in different implementations in without creating an interface and without creating using Sprint. How? We have two jars that contain the same classes with different implementations. And we use our build to decide which of those implementations we're going to utilize. <laughs> wow. Variations without interfaces. Man. And just let me tell you, where might they utilize this? In all of your smartphones. <laughs> because they don't want to utilize and use power, the extra power required to do all the extra indirection. You're never going to switch out your disk. <laughs> so they simply have different libraries. Here's our disk library for this disk. Here's our disk library for that disk. When we build the phone, we link to the correct library and we don't have the indirection, which would really start to eat up your power in your smartphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Impressing answer. So you really went down to the lowest level now. <laughs> now we can link link modules and stuff. <laughs> there are three ways to do everything. Uh, true. <laughs> you just need to come up with the three things. But indeed, the biggest takeaway is that uh, such things are language agnostic and uh, technology agnostic things. And uh, it can be applied in uh, any context, right? Uh, and these are just implementation details. So, and also it's true for just a test-driven development, domain-driven design, and all these things. And generally, as developers, we should strive for uh, picking up uh, this knowledge, the language agnostic knowledge, because what we learned, for example, framework or languages yesterday can be easily deprecated by tomorrow. So it's uh, it's better to learn language agnostic knowledge, which are which have been successfully used 20 years ago, right? Or Already and also nowadays they are really the best practices. So it's great. Thanks again for the answer. Um, yeah, my, my idea whenever I think about code is like, or, or whenever I started with domain driven design, I was like, somehow code is just yet another, like an artifact of the discussion between people basically. I it mean, it's something that the developers write, but in the end, it's something that comes out of the discussion between business people and, and the developer and all the stakeholders involved. So, And, and, and that's an interesting point because, uh, I mean, there have been years, <laughs> they've been trying to do this for years, is to have an automatic code generator, okay, <laughs> and get rid of developers. But the issue is that you need to be able to specify what you want through these tests and examples that say, here is what I want, just code it. Mm -hmm. It turns out that um, uh, some people, have, you've probably been uh, reading about uh, chat GBT. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, it one person I've been reading a uh, uh, he, he was doing some stuff and he said you know the more specific I get in the test that I'm going to run against something the better code it writes it it makes less assumptions about what mm -hmm. you're doing <laughs> I guarantee you by the way Chat GPT is not a great coder <laughs> <laughs> agree it's it's it it it. I'm going to call it, it is like the stack overflow of coding. <laughs> it will pull an example somewhere and give it, and it may not necessarily be correct. It's, it, it's just faster than me looking up the same thing of stack overflow and typing it down. Something like exactly. that. <laughs> <laughs> and we still have to test it, right? So it's not sure that it works. 
or maybe it's buggy code. So well, well, the biggest problem probably is that the business people cannot actually express what they want. So I mean, they, they <laughs> think they think they know, but when when you start, is it actually like that? And then you, I mean, that, isn't that what always happens? I mean, you have some requirement, you start implementing it, and at some point you're like, that doesn't make much sense. And then you go back and ask again, was it like that? Was it like that? I mean, I doubt that the AI is already that uh, sophisticated that it can actually do that. <laughs> definitely, definitely not. In fact, you bring up an interesting thing because when I teach this and I do it to like insurance companies, which have, oh, they have, oh, you, you haven't seen business rules until you see the ones in <laughs> an insurance company. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. So I always teach it. I say, you want to learn BDD? Yep. I said, I want, I want the product owners. The product owners must attend. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to teach it to developers and, and testers. The product owner must attend. And so in one of these sessions, uh, we got, uh, we asked for feedback at the end. The product owner made this comment saying, I never realized how much grief I was giving these programmers. <laughs> Because he would, as, as we asked them to explain, it's like he would give, here, here's what I want you to do without enough details. Uh -huh. He would make, he had it in his mind, the assumption that what he, the details that he had in his mind and the way something would work were magically in the programmer's mind. Isn't it clear? I mean, come on, I told you so. I mean, don't you see it? All the all the context around it, all my perspective, the, I, I know everything. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, oh, you guys have been working in this field for a while. You should mm -hmm. know exactly the same things. <laughs> and it's like, no, this is a new requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, wow. it's, it's true. <laughs> well... That's something. Uh, now no, I just lost it. Maybe one. We have time for uh, one more uh, question. Uh, maybe the maybe what kind of tools do you use? Not the technical tools, but te tools to communicate with the product owners or the users. Uh, I don't know. Do we have some recommendation for the audience? Some you know some technique. To, 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 to get the information in the most efficient way from the users and the product owners. What is your take on this? We have uh, two minutes for that, if you can oh, oh, briefly. Okay, so Thank you. Uh, let's see. So uh, I have two techniques. One, mural or mural, okay. depending on, which okay. is in today's world, you just can start putting up stuff and you can mm -hmm. put, up, put up context diagrams on whole works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I did write a little Gherkin editor uh, okay. which is on the Microsoft Store, uh, okay. free of charge. It's, it's not, but it, it allows you to create these gherkins. And because I use tables a lot, it actually has features in there that you can click and you can, you can it has a basically a spreadsheet dialogue box so that every table mm -hmm. that you see, you can click, it comes up in a dialogue. You can transpose tables. You can add columns, which mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. tough when you're, dealing with, you know, the actual text and reverse columns and move, manipulate it as if okay. it's a spreadsheet. So that makes a business owner go, oh, it's almost like Excel. <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> oh. Looks familiar. That's what looks I know. <laughs> um, so a collaborative white space and, you know, the Gherkin editor. Uh, what is the name? Tools. This Gherkin editor? What is it's, the name it's of called Gherkin editor? Yeah, Gherkin editor. Oh, that's your name. Okay, okay. We're going to check it out. Again. It's Absolutely. the only one. It's the only one in the Microsoft Store. <laughs> ah, great job! I'm looking forward to checking out. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, we reached the end of the session. Well, uh, what a pleasure! Thank you very much for your uh, incredible session. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, also, there are a lot of new things we can uh, read about. So, th huge thanks to you. And of course, huge thanks to the audience who stayed with us until that long. And uh, yeah, I wish you all a following great day or evening, depending on the place you guys at. And uh, yeah, I see you next time. Thank you right. very much. Thank you. Thank you.